Jiva, Atman, Psyche, Soul. Whatever you call it, the idea of an immaterial or spiritual essence at the core of every person is one of the most fundamental beliefs of almost all of the major world religions, along with many schools of philosophical thought throughout time. In the few instances during the classical period when atomistic or materialistic philosophical ideas were proposed, like the Epicureans in the West and the Charvakas in the East, they were largely met with criticism from the more dominant philosophy of idealism found in both Platonism and Hinduism, which believes that the fundamental nature of reality is consciousness. Until relatively recently, many philosophers seem not to have even questioned whether the soul really exists or not, but instead asked about the nature of soul and how it was composed. Was it material or immaterial? What happens to the soul when the body dies? Is it eternal? What is the relationship between the soul and the body? And most importantly for today's video, is the soul unified or made up of different parts? One of the most exciting things about studying the philosophy of ancient Greece is not just that we can see where so many fundamental ideas came from, but we can also see how they changed over time. When we compare the Homeric view of the soul and the afterlife to the view of later philosophers like Plato and Plotinus, we'll see that there are many differences. Anyone who has studied the Iliad and Odyssey knows that there originally wasn't much hope in the murky afterlife. But if you watched my video on the Eleusinian Mysteries, it appears that initiates to the mystic rites of ancient Greece gained much hope in regard to the afterlife. While scholars are still not quite sure about why or how ideas about the soul and afterlife changed over the course of time, we will see that philosophers like Plato and Aristotle had a much more developed conception of the soul than the poets did and their ideas have left a lasting impact on both Christian theology and Western spirituality in general. Hey, I'm Matt. You're watching Nothing New. And today we're going to begin discussing one of the most fundamental ideas in Platonic philosophy, the idea of an immortal, immaterial soul. The philosophical debates around the existence and nature of the soul include some of the most profound and long-standing questions that humanity has asked in our quest for self-knowledge and understanding and past ideas about the soul still have a deep influence on modern ideologies like individualism. So even if you don't believe in anything spiritual, there's still so much you can learn about what it means to be human by exploring what the great thinkers of the past believed about our fundamental nature. This video will be an introduction to how different ancient cultures thought about the soul, and how popular ideas about the soul changed between the time of Homer and Plato. That way, when we explore Plato's ideas about the soul in later videos, will have all the background we need to fully understand the philosophy and the traditional views that he was responding to. But before we get into it, want more videos on ancient philosophy? Make sure to subscribe and hit the bell. Anyways, let's get into it. If you study ancient Greek philosophy, you'll quickly see that many ideas can be traced back to the ancient Near East. And as I discussed in my video on the pre-Socratics, many famous philosophers and sages, including Thales, Pythagoras, Solon, and Plato, were said to have spent time studying in Egypt. Ancient historians like Herodotus knew that certain ideas found in the philosophy of the Pythagoreans, like reincarnation, were not invented by Pythagoras, but were likely inspired by their neighbors across the pond. We're going to start by exploring how the ancient Egyptians viewed the soul, so we can see how it compares to the Greek view of the soul. But first, let's talk about the big differences between how someone today might think about the idea of a soul versus how someone in the distant past might think about it. Whether you're Jewish, Christian, Hindu, or Muslim, if you believe in a soul, you probably believe that the soul is immaterial and unified, and represents your truest self in essence. One of the reasons why Descartes proposed the pineal gland as the seat of the soul was because it is the only unpaired midline brain structure, aka it isn't split into two hemispheres. The thinking went that, if the soul is unified, then it's only reasonable to assume that its location in the brain must be too. I mean, if that's where you assume it's located. The ancient Egyptians famously thought that the heart was where the soul resided, and both the spirited thumos found in Homer and the hridayam, or spiritual heart, found in Indian philosophy were thought to be located in or around the center of the chest. But that's a minor difference compared to the fact that, in many ancient cultures, it was generally believed that the soul was made up of different parts with different functions. This belief in multiple aspects to the soul, sometimes called soul dualism, can still be found in shamanistic traditions around the world. And in general, in these cultures, we find two distinct kinds of soul with distinct functions, the so-called body soul and the free soul. 
The former was linked to the function and vitality of the body, while the latter may have been a way to describe the so-called wanderings of the soul during sleep or other non-standard states of consciousness, like trances and delirium. As linguists and scholars of comparative religion began studying and comparing different ancient cultures, they found that many major cultures seem to have had this kind of composite view of the soul at some point. For instance, in traditional Chinese philosophy, it was thought that every person has both an ethereal, spiritual hun, which leaves the body after death, and a corporeal, material po, which remained with the corpse. The idea of a duality between a body soul and free soul was first proposed by Swedish philologist and professor of comparative religion, Ernst Arbmann, and this idea was later elaborated on by his pupils. In the early Greek concept of the soul, Dutch historian and professor of religious studies, Jan Bremer, says that, Ernst Arbmann found that the Vedic concept of the soul was preceded by a duality where the eschatological and psychological attributes of the soul had not yet merged. For Christian Scandinavia and classical Greece, he arrived at the same conclusion. After these high cultures, he proceeded to investigate primitive ones, where he found the same duality. Although its presence had often been obscured by the concept of the soul held by the field investigators themselves. In his analysis, Arbman distinguished between body souls endowing the body with life and consciousness and the free soul, an unencumbered soul representing the individual personality. The free soul is active during unconsciousness and passive during consciousness when the conscious individual replaces it. It is not exactly clear where the passive free soul resides in the body. The body souls are active during the waking life of the living individual. In contrast to the free soul, the body soul is often divided into several parts. Usually it falls into two categories. One is the life soul, frequently identified with the breath, the life principle. The other is the ego soul. The body soul, or several of its parts, represents the inner self of the individual. In the early stage of the development of Vedic soul belief, the free soul and the body souls did not yet constitute a unity. Later, the concept of the Vedic free soul, Atman, incorporated the psychological attributes of the body souls, a development that occurred among a number of peoples. Such a process in which the original free soul becomes absorbed by the breath soul that in turn develops into a unitary soul can be traced in the development of the following concepts. A similar development is also likely for Latin anima, breath, or free soul. Perhaps the most famous culture that had a composite view of the soul is the ancient Egyptians, though the number of parts that made up the soul varied across different eras. Sometimes it was five parts and in others seven, but generally a person was thought to be a composite of nine parts. First, there's the cot, or the physical body. Pretty self-explanatory, but we should keep in mind the importance of the body, which can be seen by the incredible amount of care put into preserving and providing offerings for the dead, since the body served as the vital link between the soul and the world. Then there is the ka, which was thought to be the vital essence or life force of every being, from plants to animals and even the gods, and which enters a being when they are born and leaves at the moment of death. Ka is sometimes translated as double, perhaps due to the artistic recreations of everyday life sometimes called a double world, which decorated some tombs where essential people and objects were depicted and were believed to support and sustain the Ka. The Egyptians believed in reincarnation, and so they thought the life force had always existed and, as Egyptologist Rosalie David says, was passed across the successive generations, carrying the spiritual force of the first creation. Next was the Ba, which personified everything that makes you a unique individual on a non-physical level, essentially your personality, symbolized by a bird with a human head this was also thought to live on after physical death, and was thought to be able to travel between this world and the afterlife, either visiting gods or returning to places on earth that were loved by the person. It would sometimes be depicted flying out of the tomb to join with the Ka in the afterlife. The whole purpose of the elaborate burial practices of ancient Egypt was to guide and support the dead through the afterlife, with the hope that they can achieve immortality. If all the funerary rites were properly observed, the Ka and Ba were thought to magically join together to form the Ak, which was associated with the intellect, will, and intentions of a person. Essentially, the Ak was thought to be the immortal higher form of the self, which lived among the stars with the gods, but also was an effective entity that could intervene in the world and could harm or help the living. There are more aspects to the soul which we could discuss, like the name, heart, shadow, and form. But the point is that, as Rosalie David says, the Egyptians believed that the human personality had many facets, 
a concept that was probably developed early in the Old Kingdom. In life, the person was a complete entity, but if he had led a virtuous life, he could also have access to a multiplicity of forms that could be used in the next world. In some instances, these forms could be employed to help those whom the deceased wished to support, or alternately, to take revenge on his enemies. But before we move on, we should remember that while the ancient Egyptians had a highly developed and intricate view of the soul, they don't seem to have believed in a purely immaterial existence. In both Egypt and Greece, and not to mention ancient schools of Eastern thought, soul or spirit was thought to be just the finest kind of matter. Until the idea of mind-body dualism became popular thanks to thinkers like Plato, the difference between matter and spirit was seen as a continuum from dense earth through water and fire and air to the finest matter you can think of, the pneuma or breath of life which was thought to animate us. This is why distilled alcohol is called spirits. Since alchemists quickly realized that the vapor which boiled off during the distillation process produced a more purified or essential form of alcohol when condensed. The Greek word pneuma often appears in the New Testament in reference to the soul or spirit, and is also reflective of the ancient connection between breath and life. Some philosophers like Heraclitus thought that the health and wisdom of someone's soul could be attributed to whether it was wet or dry, implying a certain level of physicality or materiality. This way of looking at the soul also avoided problems which later idealist philosophers would have to wrestle with. For instance, if the soul is completely ethereal and has nothing to do with matter, how could it affect or be affected by the body? The debate around these issues of mind-body interaction would become known as the mind-body problem, which was popularized by Descartes. It wouldn't be until Plato that we begin to find evidence for Greek belief in an immortal, immaterial soul. So while we may have adopted the Greek word psyche, for what has come to be known as psychology, literally the study of the soul, it would be misleading to think that the ancient Greeks shared the same ideas about the soul that are common today. As Jan Bremer says, the borrowing of the Greek word psyche for modern terms implies that the Greeks viewed the soul in modern ways. Yet, when we look at Homer's epics, we find that the word psyche has no psychological connotations whatsoever, and in Homer, the psyche may fly away during a swoon or leave the body through a wound behavior now not associated with the soul. Do these differences then suggest that the early Greeks viewed the soul and human psychological makeup differently? In the 5th century BC, having a soul was commonly thought to be what distinguished living things from inanimate matter, and the adjective ensouled, or emsukos, became the common term when people talked about being alive. This vital essence of psyche could be found in all living things. The philosopher Thales of Miletus even believed that magnets had souls, so while Homer only talked about souls in relation to human beings, we can see that by the 6th century, anything that seemed to be alive was thought to be in soul. The psychological connotations of soul which were missing in Homer also seemed to have developed by the 5th century, and it became common to refer to sensual pleasure, from food, drink, or sex, to the soul. As the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says, people are said to satisfy their souls with rich food, and the souls of gods and men are claimed to be subject to sexual desire. In contexts of intense emotion or crisis, feelings like love and hate, joy and grief, anger and shame are associated with the soul. Nothing bites the soul of a man more than dishonor, says Ajax in a fragment from a tragedy of unknown authorship, just before he commits suicide. Oedipus says that his soul laments the misery of his city and its inhabitants. Moreover, the soul is also importantly connected with boldness and courage, especially in battle. Courageous people are said, for instance, in Herodotus and Thucydides, to have enduring or strong souls. In the Hippocratic text, Airs, Waters, Places, the soul is thought of as the place of courage, or, as the case may be, its opposite. In the case of lowland inhabitants, courage and endurance are not in their souls by nature, but must be instilled by law. Similarly, in benign climates, men are fleshy, ill-jointed, moist, without endurance, and weak in soul. By this point in history, it became common to associate someone's moral characteristics with the soul as well. For instance, in Pericles' funeral oration, he says that those that have the clearest sense of both the pains and pleasures of life, but do not turn away from danger, are rightly judged strongest with regard to soul. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy points out how, to educated 5th century speakers of Greek, it would have been natural to think of qualities of soul as accounting for and being manifested in a person's morally significant behavior. Pericles acts courageously and Hippolytus temperately 
because of the qualities of their souls from which such actions have a strong tendency to flow. And their actions express and make evident the courage, temperance, and the like that characterize their souls. Once we are in a position to properly appreciate the connection between soul and moral character that must already have been felt to be natural at this stage, it should come as no surprise that the soul is also taken to be something that engages in activities like thinking and planning. If the soul is, in some sense, responsible for courageous acts, it is only to be expected that the soul also grasps what, in the circumstances, courage calls for, and how, at some suitable level of detail, the courageous act must be performed. Thus, in a speech of Antiphon, the jury is urged to take away from the accused the soul that planned the crime, in striking juxtaposition of the ideas of life soul, as in Homer, and of soul as responsible for practical thought. Somewhat similarly, in a Sophoclean fragment, someone says that a kindly soul with just thoughts is a better inventor than any sophist. Moreover, it is easy to see that there are connections between familiar uses of soul in emotional contexts and attributions to the soul of cognitive and intellectual activities and achievements. There is, after all, no clear-cut and manifest difference between, say, being in the emotional state of fear and having a terrifying thought or perception. When Oedipus's soul laments, or Ajax's soul is bitten by dishonor, emotion obviously goes hand in hand with cognition. And if it is natural to refer the one to the soul, there should be nothing puzzling about attributions to it of the other. Thus, in non-philosophical Greek of the 5th century, the soul is treated as the bearer of moral qualities, and also is responsible for practical thought and cognition. One of the most fascinating parts of studying philosophy, in my opinion, is that you're really studying the birth and development of so many important ideas and questions. Even though some of these ideas ended up hitting dead ends and got replaced, it was so important for our intellectual development towards true science that we've always been so curious and asked so many questions about literally everything. So I really want to emphasize how cool this is, that we can roughly pinpoint when the idea of a soul took on psychological characteristics and began to be identified with the thinking individual, as this was a major step in the evolution of Western philosophy. As we heard earlier, the psyche found in Homer never had any psychological connotations and was really only mentioned when someone's life was at stake. But by the 5th century, the idea of soul found in Greek philosophy had developed to a point that's much more recognizable to us today. Plato's ideas about the soul were highly influential, especially on the earliest Christian theologians, and after really studying Plato and early Christianity, I have to agree with Nietzsche's declaration that Christianity is Platonism for the people. Since it seems that ideas about the soul and the afterlife that became common in Christianity owed a lot more to Greek philosophy than the Bible. I mean, in the Bible, you'll hear way more about the resurrection of physical bodies than about the nature of the soul. So in a separate video, I plan on discussing the influence that Pythagoreanism, Orphism, and initiatory cults like the Eleusinian Mysteries had on Plato's ideas about the afterlife, and as a result, later Judeo-Christian ideas about the afterlife. Because there was just as much development in ideas about the afterlife as we've seen with ideas about the soul. As biblical scholar Bart D. Ehrman says, the ideas of a glorious hereafter for some souls and torment for others to come at the point of death cannot be found either in the Old Testament or in the teachings of the historical Jesus. To put it succinctly, the founder of Christianity did not believe that the soul of a person who died would go to heaven or hell. So what did Homer believe about the soul? Oh, that's cool. So yeah, I've been mentioning that Homer's idea of soul lacked psychological connotations, but that's kind of an understatement. While he used the word psyche, which we now translate as soul, it was much more like the Egyptian ka than our idea of soul. It had nothing to do with emotions, feelings, thoughts, or personality. It was just the essential vital force, the thing that makes you alive. So in this one aspect, we can see that the belief around soul being connected to life was a pretty consistent theme throughout history. Like the article points out, they didn't question whether the soul or psyche existed, because that would be like asking if life existed. The Homeric psyche would also exist as an empty shadow of life in the underworld, but it seems like a very gloomy and empty existence compared to later views of the afterlife, since Achilles famously tells Odysseus in the underworld that he would rather be alive and the slave of a lowly farmer than king of all the dead. In Homer, the closest thing we get to the thinking, feeling aspect of self is the thumos, which translates roughly to spiritedness, and was associated with emotions, desire, and will. 
and would later be adopted by Plato as the emotional and passionate aspect of his three-part soul. But if you want to get a better understanding of the Homeric view of the soul, I want to refer you to another video by a great history YouTuber whose focus is also on ancient Greece, Homer's Theory of the Mind by Chimelia. He does a great job explaining the concepts of psyche, thumos, and nous found in Homer, which represented the vital, emotional, and intellectual aspects of a person, respectively. So go check him out if you want a more in-depth understanding of the Homeric view. This video is long enough as it is, and I want to focus on a few other topics before I wrap this video up, so we'll have to save a deeper discussion of Homer for another video. So for the rest of the video, I want to talk about why the idea of soul may have developed in the way that it did, and how old ideas about soul and personal responsibility are still reflected in our modern society, along with how various schools of thought have transcended our limited notions of self altogether. So why did the soul go from being the source of life to the thinking mind? Unfortunately, while we can roughly say when the idea of soul took on psychological characteristics, scholars still don't know exactly why this development took place. As Jan Bremer says, It is only in 5th century Athens that we start to find the idea that the citizen can determine his own independent course of action. By the end of that century, psyche became the center of consciousness, a development not yet fully explained but upon which, most likely, a strong influence was exerted by the rise of literacy and the growth of political consciousness. In my video on slavery, I discussed how the Athenian ideology around freedom and citizenship was in all likelihood deeply influenced by the fact that they owned slaves. And as I argue in that video, societal norms, like the laws around hubris, became established to prevent ordinary citizens from being treated like slaves. So the changing beliefs around soul were likely reflective of the changing political structure of Athens. Jan Bremer tells us how, Homeric beliefs reflect the life of the small, closely-knit communities of the Dark Ages, where the life of the community was more important than the survival of the individual. In these communities, death was not yet so much the end of one person's life, but rather an episode in the history of the community and the life cycle. However, the sweeping changes in Greek society in the 8th century and after promoted an individualization that created individual concern for death and survival. In the new constellation of beliefs, the representation of the dead as witless shades lost much of its influence, but it never disappeared completely. Members of less centralized societies tend to be less individualistic. Since their life is usually structured around defined rules and customs, the role you play in society is much more important than being a unique individual. But with the rising complexity of civilization and the growing political awareness of democratic Athens, people probably became more conscious of themselves as individuals, as they tried to secure their rights and privileges as free citizens of a democratic city. As we mentioned earlier, the rise of literacy also had a strong influence on the development of ideas about the soul, and I think this is for multiple reasons. First, ideas about the afterlife and reincarnation from Egypt may have been transmitted to Greece from merchants and sailors along with the Phoenician alphabet after the Bronze Age collapse which may be why we find multiple pre-Socratics who believe in the transmigration of souls, not to mention Plato. But the rise of literacy may have also influenced the identification of the soul with the rational intellect. I think it's reasonable to suppose that, as rhetoric and political persuasion became necessary skills for gaining power in the fledgling democracy of Athens, we can imagine that intellectual prowess became more and more valued, and as a result, the soul became more and more identified with reason. Plato's identification of the soul with mind was incredibly influential, and ever since, Western philosophy and science has been highly interested in the nature of self and consciousness. But again, considering the political atmosphere, maybe it wasn't surprising that Plato seems to be the first thinker to primarily associate soul with logic and reason. I think this is also why, while the notion of soul has lost a lot of popularity, you still associate your sense of self primarily with your logical thinking mind. Since education and intelligence are just as valued in today's society, if not more. If you're like most people, you probably generally identify with the voice in your head that speaks in first person, the I or me, the thinking mind which conceptualizes reality in a dualistic subject-object frame. It's so ingrained in us that you may have never even questioned this notion of self, but there are many philosophical and religious systems which are focused on transcending the dualistic limits of our thinking mind, and identifying either with a mystical higher level of self or the idea of non-self altogether. All over the world throughout time, 
Mystics have written about experiences of non-dual awareness, where the usual limits of self are completely blown away, all dualistic thinking is negated, and the mystic becomes one with God or the Absolute. This is a common thread throughout Eastern philosophies such as Taoism, Buddhism, and Advaita Vedanta, but can also be found in Christian mysticism, Jewish mysticism, Neoplatonism, and Sufism. Eventually, thanks to perennial philosophy, and particularly Aldous Huxley's correspondence with various early psychedelic researchers like Humphrey Osmond, Timothy Leary, and Richard Alpert, all of these different traditions would gain newfound popularity with the rise of the New Age movement. While many people identify with the limited self so much that they don't even realize that there's more than one way of looking at or identifying with reality, if we listen to the various spiritual traditions, we find mystics from all around the world telling us the same thing. The self we usually identify with is an illusion. If you've never studied philosophy or spirituality, I know this video is probably getting a little crazy. And because of the nature of non-dual philosophy, at a certain point, this subject is just impossible to talk about, since it's beyond all conceptual reasoning. Tao called Tao is not Tao. Names can name no lasting name, as Lao Tzu tells us in the Tao Te Ching. But there are people out there who have written competently and coherently on the matter. I want to read you a quote from Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, A Guide to Spirituality Without Religion. The pronoun I is the name that most of us put to the sense that we are the thinkers of our thoughts and the experiencers of our experience. It is the sense that we have of possessing, rather than of merely being, a continuum of experience. So what does it mean to say that the self cannot be found or that it is illusory? It's not that people are illusory. The self that does not survive scrutiny is the subject of experience in each present moment. The feeling of being a thinker of thoughts inside one's head. The sense of being an owner or an inhabitant of a physical body, which this false self seems to appropriate as a kind of vehicle, even if you don't believe such a homunculus exists. Perhaps because you believe, on the basis of science, that you are identical to your body and brain, rather than a ghostly resident therein. You almost certainly feel like an internal self in almost every waking moment. And yet, however one looks for it, this self is nowhere to be found. It cannot be seen amid the particulars of experience, and it cannot be seen when experience itself is viewed as a totality. However, its absence can be found, and when it is, the feeling of being a self disappears. Part of the reason why I'm quoting Sam Harris is to show that you don't have to be some mystical, spiritual guru to realize or believe this stuff. And in fact, many Western neuroscientists have been inspired by the psychological depth and wisdom of Buddhism, which provides deep maps of different levels of meditative concentration. Many intelligent scholars have noticed that, if you ever study mystic texts, it seems like they're all describing the same levels of awareness or varieties of meditative experiences to a certain extent. And they pretty much all agree that the only way to access the deepest levels of awareness, where the self disappears, is to quiet the thinking mind which discriminates between subject and object. The Zen teaching of Huang Po tells us that, those who seek the truth by means of intellect and learning only get further and further away from it. Not till your thoughts cease all their branching here and there. Not till you abandon all thoughts of seeking for something. Not till your mind is motionless as wood or stone will you be on the right road to the gate. In a footnote to this section, the translator John Blofeld says that, These words recall the admonitions of so many mystics, Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, or Sufi, who have committed their experience to words. What Huang Po calls the total abandonment of Shin, mind, thought, perceptions, concepts, and the rest, implies the utter surrender of self insisted on by Sufi and Christian mystics. Indeed, in paragraph 28, he uses the very words, let the self perish utterly. Such striking unanimity of expression by mystics widely separated in time and space can hardly be attributed to coincidence. No several persons entirely unacquainted with one another could produce such closely similar accounts of purely imaginary journeys. Hence one is led to suppose that what they describe is real. This seems to have been Aldous Huxley's view when he compiled that valuable work, The Perennial Philosophy. As modern science reveals the secrets of our biology and the universe, and our perspectives on the self, individual responsibility, and free will change, we will be forced to answer tough ethical questions about how our society operates. And in fact, those questions are already being asked right now. The ethical norms of, for example, the justice system 
are deeply tied to our societal beliefs around individual responsibility, which are in turn deeply rooted in Christian attitudes about the soul. But current neuroscientists who study the connection between behavior and biology, like Professor Robert Sapolsky, raise serious questions about the notion of individual responsibility and free will in general. A famous example you can point to is Charles Whitman, more famously known as the University of Texas Clock Tower Shooter. This is how Professor Sapolsky describes him. Whitman was literally an Eagle Scout and a childhood choir boy, a happily married engineering major with an IQ in the 99th percentile. In the prior year, he had seen doctors complaining of severe headaches and violent impulses. He left notes by the bodies of his wife and his mother proclaiming love and puzzlement at his actions. I cannot rationally pinpoint any specific reason for killing her, and let there be no doubt in your mind that I love this woman with all my heart. His suicide note requested an autopsy of his brain, and that any money he had be given to a mental health foundation. The autopsy proved his intuition correct. Whitman had a glioblastoma tumor pressing on his amygdala. Since violent and criminal behavior can be directly tied to our biology and neurochemistry, it raises serious questions about how individuals can have free will and be responsible for their actions. With so much insight into the biological basis of our behavior, Professor Sapolsky now questions the morality of our current justice system, especially the aspects which seem to be only in service of our primal desire for punishment and retribution. Is punishing someone who can't control their behavior any different from burning epileptics, since it was once believed that they were possessed by spirits? As Professor Sapolsky says, once people with epilepsy were virtuously punished for their intimacy with Lucifer, now we mandate that if their seizures aren't under control, they can't drive. And the key point is that no one views such a driving ban as virtuous, pleasurable punishment, believing that a person with treatment-resistant seizures deserves to be banned from driving. It is important to remember that some, many, maybe even most of the people who were prosecuting epileptics in the 15th century were no different from us, sincere, cautious, and ethical, concerned about the serious problems threatening their society, hoping to bequeath their children a safer world, just operating with an unrecognizably different mindset. Now, he doesn't think that the justice system should be completely abolished. The role of deterrence is still a vital role which criminal punishment must play. But he argues that what must be abolished are the views that punishment can be deserved and that punishing can be virtuous. The hope is that, when it comes to dealing with humans whose behaviors are among our worst and most damaging, words like evil and soul will be as irrelevant as when considering a car with faulty brakes, that they will be as rarely spoken in a courtroom as in an auto repair shop. And crucially, the analogy holds in a key way, extending to instances of dangerous people without anything obviously wrong with their frontal cortex, genes, and so on. When a car is being dysfunctional and dangerous, and we take it to a mechanic. This is not a dualistic situation where, A, if the mechanic discovers some broken widget causing the problem, we have a mechanistic explanation, but B, if the mechanic can't find anything wrong, we're dealing with an evil car. The crux of the issue is that the entire criminal justice system, top to bottom, makes no sense whatsoever because it is predicated on 200-year-old biology. We have no control, ultimately, over anything we do. When we say, I've changed my mind about doing this or that, we are in fact saying, circumstances have changed my mind. We have no agency, and the criminal justice system does not make any sense at all. Now look, I know how scary it is when someone starts questioning society's fundamental beliefs. I mean, just look at what happened to Socrates. And I'm not saying we should abolish the justice system either, but I think it's really important for us to examine where our values come from, and how they impact the way our society functions and treats people. We take so much about the way we think about the world for granted that we never really take the time to question if we might be missing something or there might be a better way of doing things. As scholar Richard Seifert points out, our ethics are mainly culturally based and aren't set in stone, saying that our ethics require us to think of there being a person who deserves credit or blame. But there have also been societies in which credit and blame, as well as property, belongs primarily to the kinship group. Different cultures and phases of cultures construct persons differently, depending on what they are constructed from and for. While I was researching this video, I came across a term that I've never heard of before, and it just blew me away. Instead of the individual or literally undivided view of people, 
There's also the divided view like the soul dualism, which we discussed before. This has also been called dividualism, and is usually attributed to Melanesian cultures. But as we saw earlier, similar beliefs can be found in many different cultures. Here's a good description of the difference between these two ways of viewing the self. In the simplest terms, the individual is considered to be an indivisible self or person. That is, it refers to something like the essential core or spirit of a singular human being, which as a whole defines that self in its particularity. To change, remove, or otherwise alter any part of that whole would fundamentally alter the self. She, he would then be effectively a different person. By contrast, the individual is considered to be divisible, comprising a complex of separable, interrelated, but essentially independent dimensions or aspects. The individual is thus monadic, while the individual is fractal. The individual is atomistic, while the individual is always socially embedded. The individual is an autonomous social actor, the author of his or her own actions, while the individual is a heteronomous actor performing a culturally written script. The individual is a free agent, while the individual is determined by cultural structures. The individual is egocentric, and the individual is sociocentric. So let's wrap things up. If you learned anything today, I hope it's that there are many ways to look at the soul or the self, and that there's a lot you can learn about being human by trying to understand different perspectives. I think that the composite, interconnected, and interdependent view of what makes up a person is not just coherent, but very intuitive and natural. I think we can also see this representation of a person with conflicting aspects in popular imagery like the classic trope of arguing with the angel and devil on your shoulder, which represents how we often wrestle with ourselves during tough decisions, just like how Homeric heroes might talk to their thumos. The belief in the soul is one of the most important ideas in the history of Western culture, and while it has fallen out of favor in recent history, we can see how these ideas still affect our modern life. We also saw how, while wise guys like Plato and Aristotle might like to identify with their nerdy intellects above all, there are some very different levels of self that one can identify with. Anyways, that's the video. I hope you enjoyed it because this is the kind of stuff I really want to talk about. Since the point of this channel is to explore the connections between spirituality, philosophy, and history. Because they're all connected, and they all influence each other in profound ways. Now that I've covered most of the basic intro stuff I wanted to cover, we're going to be getting into more substantial and philosophical topics like this and start really exploring not only how ideas change over time, but also how they still influence our modern world. So make sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.